from historic downtown Orange, California. It's time for the Bob Gurr Show. From undersea adventures to highways in the sky, he's done it all. And now, here's your host, the man, the myth, the Disney legend, Bob Gurr. Hey kids, we have a really stellar show today. We actually are doing our first chat show where I'm the host and all the chatters are gonna chat. All of them are Orange County historians, but there's three separate kinds of historians. The first one I'm gonna introduce is um, Ken Stack. Ken Stack here is, um, He's more than a historian. He was into animation, he prints books. He's dreaming of having a uh, theme park museum, but on the way to that, he decided he's not making enough money, so he turned <laughs> into a, a real estate mogul. <laughs> Buying and selling That's real estate, true. which means he's probably going to get his museum someday. So he has a wide range of of business endeavors uh, that he's done a little bit a little bit different than the other fellows next is chris jepson over here who is the regular orthodox all orange county historian on every kind of subject there isn't a subject in this county that he doesn't already know a lot about if you've been following him he has a blog he has does a lot of interviews. He's extremely well known in the county. So I'd call him the sort of the middle of the road, know everything historian. Now we come to um, Jason Schultz here in the middle. Jason is another type of historian. Rather than being the broad brush historian, he has a singular goal in life, which is everything known about <laughs> Disneyland, and he has numerous ways to do that. And according to what I've read about him, he is um, library science. I th Are you a doctor? Of no. Huh? Two master's degrees. Two master's degree. Does that trump a doctor or the doctor? No, it does not. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's, it's very highfalutin. It took a lot of college years to do this. He was in the East with college for a long time. And then that leads to a thing called hierarchy index with associated relationships, which on the way through all those words, he is the inventor of a thing called a parkendium, which he's going to describe in, in very great detail so that these other fellows understand exactly how totally focused Jason is. Now, I have to also share it with the fact that He's kind of fuzzy-faced over here and long-haired, but I remember when he was 16 years old, he was extremely intense in those days because he had a little tiny camera, and we had Disney panels, and there's nothing more unnerving than I'm sitting with next to Tony Baxter and a couple other famous Disney Imagineers, and there's this kid there with this thing with a light on it. And whoever was talking, the light kept going around like that. And then one time, Tony Baxter leaned over and he says, watch it, the kid's going to get our job. <laughs> so, um, but thankfully, he didn't. He got the job of every fact known to mankind about Disneyland, which trumps any chief Imagineer. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Jason, you've got a golden opportunity, right? You've got a... a historian on either side, a business historian and a county historian. I forgot to mention that um, Chris Jepson is the associate Ar assistant archivist at the Orange County Archives. He's vice it. president of the Orange County Historical Society, City of Huntington Beach Historical Resources Board. He has an Orange County History Roundup that you can find at OCHistoricalBlogspot.com. And he's interested in photography, Google architecture, Disneyland, Knott's Berry Farm, about a hundred other things ending up with something somewhere in the South Pacific. That's very <laughs> important to you. Um, 
You can. I've gone over a little bit of what you do because you have a, you have the broad business experience. So I don't know how broad it is, but I've, I've okay. been around. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> have at it, guys. Get started. But I'm going to ask Jason if you have a question or two for either one of these gentlemen. I'd like to see what the kind of thing that you're missing in in your parkendium and your the the source of facts. Maybe they know something they haven't haven't told you yet. <laughs> well, Ken. It's been 15 years since I've known you. <laughs> and when am I going to I know where you're going. Into your <laughs> I know where you're see, going. Yeah. See what, yeah. You know, I've seen some of a few boxes you've had at your right, house in your right. Linda, but right. what's the status of your archive? We've okay. got we've got stuff in storage at four different locations and it's always difficult to get in. You're Quite not control? You, well, some of it, yeah. You're not the first person to be asking and I know you want the photos too. You always get a pretty good sample of what we have uh, but for the Parkendium I know, is that where you're starting, is with mostly photos online? Uh, more with than anything the else? online a aspect of Parkendium, it's it started as more photo focused because people are more interested in that, but right. I do have a lot of documentation I'm scanning from Patrick Jenkins' ephemera. Uh, right. So I want it all, but what's right. currently available is the photos, and because of the great vintage blogs, you'll easily find a lot of photos of Disneyland from the 50s and 60s into the 70s, but what's really much rarer online are photos from the 70s and 80s, 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. And it's not that people were taking fewer photos, it's just that the way that people documented back in the 50s and 60s on slides yeah. uh, is different than yeah. how they did later and how it has made it out into the public and consciousness. Pe people are so visual anyways, it's kind of the first thing they want to look at is the pictures. So what, like, what sort of stuff do you have from like the 80s and 90s? <sighs> Are you talking about related. photographs mostly, or yeah, just yeah? Say... It's mostly a lot of paper blueprints, uh, things that were never built. Um, again, just just the blueprints are primary. If you're talking 80s and 90s, yeah, because our focus always was earlier than that, mm -hmm. um, kind of, you know, Walt era, 50s, 60s, uh, into the 70s. But once you get into the 80s and 90s, it becomes a little more skimpy, I'd say. But yeah, if you're looking for 80s, and is that primarily where your focus is? Uh, it's just time? what kind of a hole in the collection where okay. where I'm doing like comparisons across the years that I post on social media of like you know this area in these different looks, and then the right. 80s and 90s, unless I already have it, like it's just a hole, a black hole. Well, the problem with the 80s and 90s is kind of you know photography just kind of shifted then, uh, whereas before that everybody was into slides. There's a lot of slides through the 50s and 60s, but as you got into the 80s and 90s. I, at least for our collection, I noticed that a lot less pictures seemed to be taken as you got past that. Time. But I don't think there were fewer being taken. I think they were just being taken with negative. In a different way. Negative, negative right, right. Probably didn't survive. And, and then we'll, the, the, the photos you find online tend to be bad iPhone photos of right. faded prints. And then it, yeah. yeah. A lot yeah. of the stuff from the 70s and 80s I deal with in archival collections are, you know, they were, they were shot on little tiny film for instamatic cameras right the one is lousy quality so and then they would print them on textured paper because that was fancy mm -hmm. so by the time you do that and of course you don't keep your negatives because you know why would you do that and so now you have fuzzy images printed on textured paper and now you want to scan those and put them in a book or something it's it's a it's a mess it's so we've got decades like you would think photo quality would just improve and improve and improve <laughs> and but it's the the line is more like this over time it's up and down depending you know you can hand me a glass plate negative from 1905 and we can just get ridiculous clarity out of it yeah. but yeah, 1970s, all my childhood photos, eh, pretty yeah. bad, pretty yeah, bad. It kind of turns to snapshots, and yeah, yeah like you say, the quality yeah. isn't there. Yeah. yeah. Well, I had so. the same problem with my own documentation of Disneyland in the 90s that I started with an APS film camera, which is already a little bit worse than 35 millimeter, but then I got a digital video camera in 1998, and I could take way more photos, but they're all 640 by 480 and heavily <laughs> compressed. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I've I'm always happy when I see high quality photos from that era that I have lived through. Right, yeah. right. Or, yeah, yeah, my fear is always that uh, eventually as time goes on, because everything is going you know, on the computer, we're going to be losing this because people aren't printing out these pictures. They're just kind of storing it in other means, which I don't know how long they're going to last. Right. So that's another reason for Parkendium is trying to preserve the digital things. Right. And, uh, right now it's mainly my own collections that are available and rehosting stuff from the park and gorillas don't blog. Um, but if I could get other digital collections, right. um, that would be fantastic just because however many millions of photos are being taken every day. Yeah. Um, 
but digital preservation is a very hard thing, as I think we all yeah. know. Yeah. Well, your work impresses the heck out of me. I mean, everything you've been doing with the Parkendium is just so impressive. Um, I go in there periodically and take a look at stuff, but I don't know how you've done it all these years. It's crazy. Yeah, a it's a depth it. and breadth and attention to detail that's really impressive. And, mm -hmm. and that's not, I mean, it is the Disney stuff. It's not just the Disney stuff. Um, for, for those of us doing broader Orange County history work, uh, I like to point out, um, up until just literally the last couple months, there's been no way to access all of the early Anaheim newspapers mm. except through a website that you put together. And you, the, the fact that he was down there at the Anaheim History Room, part of the public library <laughs> system there, uh, every week scanning microfilm, <laughs> organizing it, getting it cleaned up and put online so people could use it and access it and research with it, do research with it, is just an incredible gift yeah. that we, we, all, we all had. And it, believe me, that is widely appreciated. Uh -oh. And that, that's, uh, uh, yeah, we understand. I think everybody understands how much work that is. I don't know uh, how he has the time. Uh, yeah. And then work yeah. the time Are there like well? three of you or something? Yeah. Because it's amazing. And, and well, I have two daughters, so pretty soon yeah. there will be three of us. Teach them how to do this. Teach them well, yes. <laughs> well, thanks, Chris. I just wanted to learn more about my house's history. So. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's a yeah. whole other topic. I mean, yeah, because it was owned by who again? It was, it was built for the Presbyterian minister and had some other uses uh, through the years, but it's right. 100 years old now. Right. Right. Great. Well, Jason, Great. tell us, tell our viewers what about your house because it's got some unique history, and it's really uh, close to downtown. It's got a, a wife and two gorgeous little girls living in this historic place. Tell us a little bit more about that home. So, built in 1921 for I won't go into the whole history of the property because I could do that, but the the home was built in 21 for the Presbyterian Church. Three different ministers uh, lived there before it was sold off because they spent too much money on their new church organ at the church they were building downtown. Mm -hmm. And then it was owned by an older woman uh, and her mother, who was the mother-in-law to Illinois Congressman Dan Rostenkowski. Uh, then it was bought by uh, a future Anaheim mayor who was on the city council, Rex Coons. Mm -hmm. He was the Anaheim mayor who brought the angels to the city. Um, and he may have been there at the 1959 dedication of the monorail, because I think they invited some Anaheim right. City people. So the person living in wow. my house may have been there All when right. you kidnapped Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon. And then uh, three years later, he sold it to a couple who used it as a wedding event center, uh, the Gemway Wedding Event Center, uh, which any of your viewers out there got married there between <laughs> 1962 and 1990. You, you photos, right? see, <laughs> see photos. Um, and then it was sold to another mayor of Anaheim, Fred Hunter, who uh, let a, a local uh, religious cult use it for uh, group housing. And oh. then it was renovated by the city uh, through the redevelopment program, uh, back to single family home. And I bought it from the couple who had uh, owned it since 2004. Very well, nice. how did you find out it was for sale and that you, uh, did you know all the history before you bought it? Or? No, I only knew that it had a colonial revival look to it. Oh. And since I got my history from Williamsburg and, and back East, um, it had always been a house that just kind of stood out to me. And then uh, I was walking by one day and saw the for sale sign. And, uh, and then once I bought it, I read the Mills Act survey because it was already historically protected. But the survey was only one page long and I realized that there was a little more that you could find out. And naturally you, could, you were the guy to go digging. Yes. You got it all and put it all together. Probably within a day. Uh, no, I digitize all the newspapers so if I can search them that way. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, as I'm listening to you fellows um, talking about the, the, the value of older, higher quality of photographic stuff, it just occurred to me, I've got a, a box or two, you know, like a tie box full, of um, glassine uh, envelopes full of black and white negatives that I personally shot in the early years of Disneyland. Wow that I never... You got three well, people want to see those. Okay, well... <laughs> Where are they? <laughs> well, I, I used a Leica red dial. If you know what a red dial Leica is with a, with a 50 millimeter lens... It's a good camera. And yeah. I used a meter and all that stuff. And I developed the film myself. I, develop, wow. I printed everything off the... But I was using a, a fairly slow ASA film uh, called Plus X, mm -hmm. okay. which, which is slow enough. It's not not like 25 ASA for like a for color slide or something, 
but uh, it does make big, very big scannables. But these were all in-house, behind the scenes as we built things. I'm wondering if you would like those. Oh I would. Oh my gosh! I can. Oh, yeah. yeah. well, would you? Well, would, yeah. are we would, uh, No, we'll all arm wrestle. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, hey, he's turning me down. Do, do, do you want them? Uh, absolutely. Well, I'll uh, digitize them and then pass them off to. I just want to see them. Oh, yeah. I just want to see them. <laughs> and you can see them. All right. 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 So we all. Right. The, uh, well, at the moment, puzzle. since uh, he's got the di digitizing thing, which I'll have, have to go first before you know you well, want to want to get that data off first. When did you look at them last? Probably the day I, I printed them so back been... in the 50s. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, yeah. I think there, there's two kinds of historians. Uh, uh, there's hoarders, and you run across them occasionally that are, you know, I have all this information, I have all this stuff, but it's mine, it's mine. Oh. I'm a happy miser, as Daffy Duck says. <laughs> but, um, you know, and, but then there are the sharers, the people who their their goal is to yeah they love finding this stuff but they want it out there in the world to do some good and if they can provide context for that i think all of us yeah pretty, pretty well yeah. ascribe it's to that. fun to share i mean it exactly really, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah leaving it in a box so when we find out that there's a forgotten set of photos somewhere that are going to have broad appeal yeah. to people who are interested in a subject like disneyland's history yeah. um yeah our first instinct i think for all of us is Let's yeah. get it out yeah. in the world so it can Let's do some good. Let's take a look. Yeah. Well, this, yeah, this is what I, I've just recently done. It turns out, the number one, I never intended uh, to, to live to be almost 92 <laughs> and then still working uh, with a program like this. But over the years, I uh, had seen some drawings that were made starting around 1929 for a custom car body company in Pasadena. Uh, and the designer's name was Frank Hershey who was in his 20s in Pasadena. And there was a 12-year-old kid on a bicycle who came up there and asked the man to show him how to draw cars. And his name was, uh, was uh, Struther McMinn. Hmm. Struther McMinn later became uh, one of the important instructors of the Art Center College of Design to teach industrial design and automobile design. Then when Hershey passed away, all his drawings went to Struther McMinn. When Struther McMinn died over 20 years ago, they all came to me. Mm -hmm. So I've been sitting there with all these drawings, which I photographed and documented, gave numbers and everything, and I finally just slowly decided, like you said, why let them sit in the box? So uh, I talked with several people for several years to find where to, these kind of documents would go, because they're automotive, of course. Uh, many museums said, yeah, we'd take them. Then what are you going to do? And we'll put them on our vault and you'll never see them again. Mm. That's not going to do any, anybody any mm. good. Mm. So it suddenly dawned on me that uh, there was a fellow I was thinking of that lives in here in Orange County. But before I could do anything about it, Ernie sends me a photograph one day of a drawing I painted in 1954. And I wonder whatever happened to it. It was my best drawing ever. And Ernie says, oh, he's a, he's a Bob Gurr fan. Where did you get the picture? Oh, I took it. A neighbor down the street's got the painting on his wall. Wow. Oh, what's the neighbor's name? It was Randy Ema, the foremost oh. Duesenberg expert in the world. <laughs> uh, and Ernie immediately arranged the fact I'd go down. All this happened very, very quick, this sort of thing. I go down there, and uh, there's an office, and he shows me something like 13,000 original drawings of all the mechanical parts of a Duesenberg chassis. And I've known Randy Ema for 30, 40 years because yeah. he was one of the chief concourse judges in some of the big concourse delegates, fancy name for car show. Mm -hmm. uh, and then later I was chief judge at or some Orange County uh, concourse. So lo and behold, I had already had the connection. I didn't realize as this slow loop went around. Wow that now we are able to give them officially to Randy Ema. Man. But before that happened, there's another entity making a so-called Bob Gurr movie, and we had location shoots. One of the location shoots was Jay Leno's Garage. Mm. Randy Ema shows up. He and Jay and I am going to talk about cars. He shows up with this painting, and then he says, let's go to your house, and I'll give you all the drawings. 
So he happily has all the drawings. He phones up every couple of days asking a question about this. Question: about The more he discovers, the more he discovers. So I am so relieved to take some documents that are not necessarily the photographs, they're original drawings, and see that they're now in the hands of somebody in Orange County who will cherish them and make sure they will continue to go on. So uh -huh. maybe I'm doing my little <laughs> historian, historian uh, uh, Orange County part. Yeah, oh, yeah, if you've got old Disneyland photographs, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of people going to want to see those. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure Randy is already thinking about uh, what's going to happen to all of this stuff someday because none of us get to get we're all just we're all just borrowing it you know uh -huh. we're all just hanging on to it for a yeah. while so i'm sure he has a, a larger plan for what happens well, to he, materials he, he, holds. he and i've discussed that yeah he, he takes it that he's he has stewardship mm -hmm. because he's got personal items from the Duesenberg brothers out of their homes more than the technical things to do with. And of course, he's restored like over a hundred Duesenbergs. If you look at the collections in America of uh, custom bodied uh, Duesenbergs, the majority are cars that were restored in his shop right. when, he, when he was busy with a shop. Now, he, he showed me his cars. He's probably got like 30 cars and various vehicles in various wow. conditions and, it, and uh, his garages today. So he's very aware of, yes, he has stuff that uh, the time will come. Uh, I'm a lot older than him, so my, my time's a little sooner, so I, it's kind of fun to give it to a younger guy. <laughs> yeah. So it's... do you have some questions more detailed for Jason? Oh, well, um, I don't know. We, we talk occasionally. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, Jason and I have actually been working on a, a project, and, and we're not entirely sure what it's going to turn into. It started out as it was going to be a uh, documentary about the Anaheim Halloween Parade, and we're sort of on a committee that's working on this. There's a bunch of really good uh, uh, people in the city of Anaheim working on this, because that parade goes back to 1924. And it's, uh, so it's got a long, rich history. We're coming up on the centennial mark. And there was some interest in putting together a, possibly a documentary. We're not sure if that's the route it's going to ultimately take, but, um, or if it turns into a book down the line or, or what. But we're trying to get the, the pieces in place um, to conduct more oral histories with people in the community who remember it. You know, some, some people who have... Uh, you know, some of their early memories uh, now uh, of, of the parade and, uh, uh, and and people who've been involved over the years, you know, more recently as well, and kind of help build that story up because it's a, it's a great community story and um, it's, a, it, it's a good community tradition story. And in a place the size of Orange County, frankly, as transient as Southern California, where people come and go all the time, um, sometimes keeping those community spirit kinds of events is difficult to hang on to them over the long haul. And uh, the fact that Anaheim's been able to do that is, is pretty awesome. And we're, and there are been, there have been so many super talented people involved in that parade over us, over the course of the century, that it's also a chance to kind of look at that and talk about what they've done. And, uh, so we're we're picking away at at, at that being part of that that process. I remember um, going to that parade when I was a kid. We'd sit on the curb, seventy, seventy one, seventy two. Yeah, I think we had you out a few years ago. Yeah, you came yeah. Out and and sat I think, on our lawn I, think and... I might have shared some old slides I had even from then, if yeah. I remember right. Well, you know, a few years ago, I, know, I, know. I volunteered to do a little bit of work for, uh, at the little shop where people were preparing the floats. Yes. And not knowing what what I was getting into, and I kept thinking. The parade starts about two miles from here, and this is where the floats are. And they says, Bob, they have casters. We push them up there. Here, you take this one, you guys take that one. <laughs> I, I thought, well, I am really deep into the Anaheim Parade. I'm, I am pushing a lopsided caster thing up the street, puffing and uh -huh. puffing and puffing. 
Nobody and warned they you. said, oh, well, the car will drive you back. Go get another one. And I, <laughs> so I, I did two of these things. And I got there in time to ride in the parade car that I was supposed to be in the parade. But I didn't know I had to help prep the parade. In oh, order I believe to you were it. grand marshal, were you not? <laughs> Oh, yeah, one year I was a grand marshal yeah. in my little fire engine, yes. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but that, I, yeah, they forgot to have me, ask me to push. <laughs> uh, well, I think a lot of, I mean, certainly the hundreds of thousands of Bob Gurr fans out there uh, in, uh, in Internet land that are watching this, you know, they know Disneyland. They know yeah. a lot about Disneyland, and, you know, that's a key focus. And But they may not all realize, some of them do, but not all of them realize how much other history there is surrounding Disneyland, all through the city of Anaheim, that this is a place that goes back to the 1850s as a, as a German wine colony, mm -hmm. uh, vineyard colony, and, uh, you know, that, that they, they bought the land from uh, 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 the, the man who owned the rancho, you know, the, the, the Mexican rancho that had been there. So, um, you know, and all that has happened over the years, uh, in over the, the the centuries in Anaheim, there's so many fascinating stories, and uh, so I, I hope that you know, as time goes on, more people will extend their interest from just the history of Disneyland to expand that out to incorporate more of Anaheim because there's a lot of great stories to tell. Mm -hmm. Anaheim Halloween Parade is definitely one of them. Mm -hmm. Home, uh, beautiful neighborhoods, including the one your home is in. Right. Um, I wanted to jump in yeah. on, maybe this goes back to being too insular and goes against your point, but I made a new historical discovery this weekend when I was tagging photographs. Um, so there's a great Dave Land photo um, right. from probably 1956 of Frontierland showing one of the Mike Fink keelboats and a cast member kind of leaning there casually. And as I tagged it and went to the next photo, my mind registered, hey, you need to go back to that photo. And when I went back, I saw that that was Ron Dominguez. And so there's a couple of interesting things, not only because it's Ron Dominguez and a yeah, vintage photo. How old, how old is he, you think? Is he like... 1920? Yeah, thereabouts. Um, and so... And so the second thing is that he was in the middle of his family's former property. <laughs> and then the third thing is in the background, you could see the famous Dominguez palm, the palm that palm had been planted, planted for his grandparents' wedding um, by Tim Carroll, who was a famous pioneering Anaheim horticulturist. And uh, Disney moved uh, to Adventureland uh, during construction. But there are also two other palm trees that were on the Disneyland property that were moved to Adventureland that, had, uh, that went way back to the 1890s. Um, the poet Ella Wheeler Wilcox. Um, do you know her name, Bob? I've heard the name. And uh, not... her, her most famous line is, uh, oh. smile and the world smiles with you, weep oh, okay. and you weep alone. Okay. So she had, uh, I think it's her, her nephew, owned uh, 10 acres of property on the future Disneyland site. Mm -hmm. And she uh, and her husband visited a few times. And I found references to her visits in the Anaheim Gazette, just from oh, reading right. it several times. Mm -hmm. And the story goes that the palm trees were planted um, for them. And uh, when her husband died, his palm tree stopped growing. So they're at unequal heights. Oh, wow. And I had read the story in the, uh, in the LA Times from doing historical research back in the 90s. And I just thought it was a weird story that got all the facts about the Dominguez palm wrong. Um, but then I was looking at a high resolution <laughs> construction photo from August of 1954, and you could see two unequal height palm trees. Yeah. And then from having done all this other tagging and, and the Imagineering story and the behind the attraction show, you could see that there were three palm trees and you could see where they were uh, near the Jungle Cruise boathouse. Um, and unfortunately, those were both removed by the early 1960s. Well, um, let me ask this question. You say that because one person died and there were a pair of palm trees <laughs> and one stopped growing. I'm not saying that I believe that story. I'm saying that's... that's what the story is and why I remembered the thing. Well, no, if, if, if that's a story, the guest, uh, the guest we had here just this afternoon talked about some of the paranormal things that she looks at, huh. uh, she, and she's quite serious because that's, that's yeah. a very, uh, they're very serious studies. And I hear these little things every once in a while, and I think, oh, that can't be. And now you hear, you tell me about the palm tree. <laughs> well, I can tell you the details. There's more than the Mahon Invention in Disneyland. It's a spooky uh, palm. Okay, you, You're going to rename the, those palms. Okay, <laughs> for, the, for you viewers, that uh, the story that went by very quickly, if I get the history right, one of the 
executives of Disneyland was born in Disneyland before it was Disneyland. Is that true? I don't know where he was born. Yeah, where he was he been, born? He born there. I'm not he was certainly there. raised yeah. and right. lived there, though. All right. right. Yeah. And the home was there. On the Dominguez Ranch. That he ranch. was growing yeah. up. Yeah. That's interesting. He stood still. Walt dragged all the dirt around, brought all this stuff in, and Ron was still standing there. And he's got a great photo now. <laughs> have you seen the photo? It's fantastic. I have not. That's, you awesome. have That's wonderful. It's, yeah. yeah, go to Dave Land and take a look, because he's got it posted there. It's wonderful. Well, people, and, all, yeah, people don't think of Disneyland as a community business, but it, it is. Yeah. And, you know, obviously, you know, Ron Dominguez, you go to work for local employers and the local employer at that point, one of the big, the biggest was Disney and, you know, uh, work, work your way on up. So, yeah, it's. And that was Ron's role through the years. He was Mr. Anaheim. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was the community liaison. Yeah. yeah. So while it seems like a freak occurrence, there's a certain logic to it. It's crazy. And he's got a window on Main Street, right? Mm -hmm. Where is his window? You would know. Markets. Is it? Okay. Okay. And then the other Ron Dominguez thing is that his family home was used as half of the original administration building right. until 1966. And there's a great photo that ran in the Disneyland line um, when he retired, showing him taking the first sledgehammer um, yeah, mark I to it. I remember that. It was yeah. being yeah. destroyed. Wow. Yeah, that, um... That home was uh, our first administration building, and I remember in our first year, <clears throat> uh, my boss, Roger Brogy Sr., we were working out of the studio machine shop, and we came down several days a week and would meet with Admiral Joe Fowler, who was key into building Disneyland, but it was always interesting. Why do we have to go to an old house and go upstairs in a bedroom to discuss <laughs> <laughs> the business? <laughs> but the company grew so fast, and it was a very substantial home. Uh, and they had a fire department parked next to it because it, we had a fire department without really a building, but because we had a fire engine next to the building, that constituted the fire department. That's all you need. Uh, but I remember that home very well. It was uh, always interesting to... Being an administration thing, it was a beautiful home. It was two homes. Yeah, there were, yeah, there, there were two of them right there. Those are the two behind Tomorrowland back that they moved back yeah. there. Because what was the one across the street there? What that was a like the first hiring office? Yeah. On West. Yeah. That's where they did the hiring from. Okay. But the two that they moved back to Tomorrowland is what Bob's talking yeah. about. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There were a bunch of Disneyland site houses, and if you don't either have a list that you review regularly, uh, you're gonna get them all kind of mixed up and confused. And there's still ongoing research as exactly what happened to each house and right. when. Right. Uh, but I think eventually we'll know the details. And you read that. some of the horror stories about one was burned down and- Or just, two. Or, all, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why? It's all kinds of interesting stories. Maybe yeah. Bob remembers some of those. Yeah. But if uh, I could if I could inject one more house fact relates to Ron Dominguez. So the Dominguez house that you're familiar with, that was their second house on the property, an earlier house that was built I think, I don't know when it was built, um, but it was moved off the property in the 1920s and it still survives in downtown Anaheim. Mm. I have a qu another question for you. A few minutes ago, you mentioned a certain Mr. Nixon. Uh -huh. I think you are associated with it. If I recall, <laughs> you were in school in the East for quite some time and then you moved West with some documents and helped out in your- I moved separately from the documents, just. Just okay. to be clear. Well, <laughs> it, you sound like you had a very interesting uh, time to do with uh, documents for something that would be in Yorba Linda, even if it wasn't directly in Orange County here. What can you tell Orange us County. about that? <laughs> yeah, so my day job, I'm the supervisory archivist at the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum, which is a part of the National Archives and Records Administration. Uh, and we just celebrated our 16th uh, anniversary and I joined in the first year of it being a federal uh, library back in College Park, Maryland, where mm -hmm. the documents had been kept for many years. And I helped to move the presidential materials uh, to the new presidential library mm -hmm. in Yorba Linda, steps away from Ken here, um, and uh, have, have done a lot to uh, describe the collection and process the collection. Um, and actually, we just opened the files of the White House Advance Office, which include documentation of President Nixon's planned but never taken trip to the grand opening of Walt Disney World. Mm -hmm. um, instead, Haldeman went down with the flag. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, also his uh, his remarks to the, the Associated Press um, 
conference at the uh, Contemporary Hotel in 1973, where he delivered the famous I'm not a crook one. Right, right. So that's why we have blueprints of the Contemporary Hotel in our holdings at the Nixon okay. Library. Wow. I think at one time you told me if I wanted to hear the missing 18-minute tape, you had the keys to the room <laughs> where the tape was pull coming. them out? Yeah, but I didn't tell you that to have it recorded. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> well, anyway. Uh, nine minutes of it singing the Michigan rag. Right, right. right. Yeah. It's not worth well, listening anyway, to. Anyway, uh, Anyway, friends, uh, I want you to know that uh, Jason here, besides being uh, such a, a Disneyland uh, historian of the highest degree, yeah. um, he served America to do with the Nixon Presidential Library papers by mm -hmm. being a documentarian, whatever, however you, it was a good sounding title. Right? <laughs> archivist. Yeah, archivist. Archivist uh, that initiated from uh, the White House to California. Yeah, yeah. So what... Um, Lately, what I've been up to? <laughs> well, sure, you, you do the all book? kinds of that. You, wanna, you, wanna, you had a story about the tram oh, that you were gonna tell, and I wanna okay. hear your story. This is called Stack's Liberty Ranch Collection, Volume 3 by Ken Stack. If you look really, really, really close, you'll see the original Universal Studios tram car design. It was made in several versions, different colors, but I happened to talk to Ken a little earlier, and I said, uh, I had the first ride in that car, and he said, well, tell me uh -huh. on the show. So, you hold on to that, right. hold that up. It turns out <laughs> Universal wanted to have a tram for their movie tour, so it made more sense for the guests. Anyway, they uh, sourced a low bidder, and the low bidder was a friend of mine named Bud, uh, Dard, uh, Bud Dardine, and he had a little company called Minibus, and he had no money, and he was going to have to get wheels, engines, transmissions, and stuff, which he got from the Ford Motor Company for no money down and pay when Universal finally paid him. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you uh, launch a little business like that. Anyway, the vehicle, the first one was built, and uh, Harper Goff uh, was one of Disney's artists with his playing with his banjo in the Firehouse Plus Fest Hive Five, was out at the factory in, in uh, Huntington Park, and Bud said, well, the first vehicle runs, and we're going to take it out and test it, and, uh, and Bud is going to operate the sound system, and Bob, you're going to ride as the first passenger in this in this minibus. <laughs> well, that was the period of time when um, uh, Barry Goldwater was running for president. And I, you'd have to know Harper Goff, uh, kind of a funny <laughs> character of a guy. We're driving down the street in the lunch hour in Huntington, Huntington Park, and he's got this speaker turned up really loud, and he's saying, vote for Goldie Waterbury, vote for Goldie <laughs> Waterbury, and I'm the only visible person in the car. <laughs> I, could, I couldn't bury my, my face fast enough. <laughs> but uh, I always remember when I finally saw the cars, which were pink, the first pink right, ones. Right, right. Um, I looked at it and I said, oh, man, I was so embarrassed to ride in that car for the first time. <laughs> so... Uh, it was a piece of history came back when you showed me that. Yeah, well, this uh, copy's that, yours, so you can. Oh, you can I got my. Oh, page oh my page 135, okay, you, I think, has King Kong. In okay, it. you guys keep talking. I'm gonna, <laughs> you know, you know, I want to hear your stories. That's no, what I'm, I'm, I'm here for. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Let me leave Keep talking. Say go, something. Go to 135, and that'll. that'll yeah, right, you okay. Oh, Chris. boy. Ooh, there's all kinds of stuff. I actually stuff don't really know what the Orange County Archives Disneyland landscape of materials is like. Do you have a briefing on that? Uh, well, yeah, and and <laughs> like you have your day day job as an archivist, I have my day job as assistant archivist for the county. Um, uh, but uh, which is not really the hat I I came wearing today. But um, yeah, we have a limited amount of Disneyland material. Generally, um, I mean, obviously Disney has their own archives, which. Uh, if you're a member of the public or uh, trying to get in there, not not part of not a Disney employee, good luck. Uh, they 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 guard their own material pretty pretty uh, closely, obviously. But there is also a you know the the other official repository of Disneyland history is uh, the Anaheim History Room, um, run by the wonderful Jane Newell in in uh, downtown Anaheim, 
and uh, and her team there. Um, great folks. They've got a lot of amazing stuff. Um, but uh, so from that standpoint, not a lot leaks out that ends up being, you know, great material unless you're going to go, you know, and, and things fall into the hands of collectors as well. Sure. And so... Yeah, there isn't a lot just floating around loose in the universe that's going to get donated to us. We have a couple boxes of collected material relating to Disneyland. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think some of the cooler stuff we have on Disneyland is actually in the John Waite collection. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, he was, John worked at Disney. Well, <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. <laughs> he told me, you know, well, the archives ended up getting the Knott's Berry Farm collection um, and this is the repository for that. And so then when Bud Hurlbut, who did all the rides and attractions for Knott's, passed away, or up to a, po up to a point in history, I mean, he did the log ride, the mine mm -hmm. ride, a lot of the biggies. And when he uh, passed away, his attorney and a, a friend who was handling the estate said, oh, a bunch of this stuff ought to go to, to the archives because you got all the Knott's stuff, Bud stuff ought to go there too. So we have a wonderful Bud Hurlbut collection. Anything that Ken <clears throat> didn't uh, manage to buy we, from the we estate, got his we have. So we got his formal office, which was full of goodies. It's so. incredible what yeah. you have. Yeah. It is, and um, you know, and we're you know, archives aren't really in the 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 uh, artifact business in any kind of big major way. So that is yeah, your storage is a little important. Well, no, just you know, we're <laughs> uh, archives are focused on documents. Yeah. And uh, sometimes there are a few artifacts that tie into the documents and it makes sense to hang on to them. Um, especially since we don't, there really is no Orange County History Museum, yeah. uh, which is a shame and something I'd love to see change. But anyway, so we, uh, you know, the, the archives ends up with uh, the Knott stuff and then Bud stuff. And then after Bud passes, John Waite, who had worked for Bud and had worked at Knott's and had been instrumental in a lot of different things, getting the log ride up and running. Um, getting uh, Halloween Haunt up and running and, and as a regular thing. And he said, oh, my stuff ought to go there too. So mm -hmm. I remember going over to his apartment and we went through this big walk-in closet full of boxes and he had to show me everything and talk about it <laughs> and tell me what each thing was. And uh, I, I love John. He's just an he's, awesome he's a great guy. Great guy, great guy. Um, you know, he, he could make uh, uh, six hours of chatting back and forth seem like about half an hour and you'd yeah. lose track of time. I recorded all my interviews with him. So oh, awesome. I've got him on tape. Oh, that's so, great, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I mainly just jotted lots of notes yeah, rapidly, I, I had so to have the tape machine good going, good yeah. good plan but uh he's going through these boxes okay now this is from when i worked with bud and this is not very farm stuff and you're gonna want that and you're gonna want that and then i said well what's in those boxes over there he says oh you're not going to be interested in any huh. of that that doesn't have anything to do with knots has nothing to do with bud you you won't you won't be interested well just you know humor me what you know oh well you know when i first got out here i got a job at disney studios and then they, so when they opened up Disneyland, they needed a bunch more people over there. And so I applied to go be one of the first people to work at Disneyland. So I ended up um, going over there and uh, 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 working for Walt there. And he said, I did all kinds of jobs until it kind of settled in on something. And uh, so I just saved all the mimeographed sheets, memos <laughs> that went out to staff. I shaved, saved all these notes and little bits of paper. And yeah, that's what's in those boxes. But that's not knots or buds. So you would wow. say, well, you know what? It's still Orange County history. Yeah. And, you know, it's like I often say, people say, well, are you a theme park historian? And um, not especially. There are people, obviously, who focus on that. And uh, that's great. I, I'm, as, you, as you pointed out, Bob, I, I, I'm one of the few people left who's like looking at Orange County big picture and trying to, you know, get the, the, the broader scope of everything. We got two big theme parks in our local history. Yeah. So I need to know about those. I yeah. don't necessarily need to know as deeply as you guys do because I've known you guys for many, <laughs> many years and I can call you up on when it gets down to that nitty gritty. I don't necessarily have to know where everything is, every bit of information at every given moment. I have to know where to go look for it. Right. And sometimes, <laughs> Not infrequently, these guys are where you go look for it. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's ask uh, Jason, tell me about your um, uh, Parkendium. 
Mm -hmm. uh, is that a made-up name? Is it that, is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I also understand uh, this is uh, available to the public for research purposes. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us how people would go about doing that? Sure. Um, so to backtrack, Parkendium is kind of my umbrella term now for the past five years to describe my efforts to create kind of a comprehensive Disneyland reference work. And my area of focus is kind of the Disneyland Resort through its first hundred years. So I still have some work to do. <laughs> and it started out, well, I did a lot of research back when I was a cast member and a teenager before then, um, that when I went to library school, uh, I started building my Disneyland thesaurus, which I showed you, I think, back in maybe 2009. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been working on that for a long time. And then during the pandemic, I started to more intentionally build uh, a digital Disneyland archive, um, digitizing tens of thousands of photos from negatives, um, and then also um, doing more indexing work on photos I'd saved from what I consider the great vintage blogs, Disneyland blogs of stuff from the park and Gorillas Don't Blog and Dave Land Blog. And uh, eventually through Twitter, because um, I describe myself as building a digital Disneyland archive, um, I followed Peter Krogh, who's one of the uh, leading experts on digital asset management, and mm -hmm. he's with a company called Mediagraph. And he said he'd love to know more about my project. Mm -hmm. And I described it, and he's like, wow, that's pretty cool. We'd yeah. like to host it. Yeah. And so I have a, a hosting implementation for kind of the digital asset management side of it, um, mainly focused on photographs, but I am digitizing uh, from the collection of Patrick Jenkins, who's mm -hmm. one of the premier Disneyland ephemera paper collectors mm -hmm. and photograph, uh, vintage photograph. Um, so more of that gets up there as well as my own collections. Um, and then I'm still working. I have a very rough implementation of all that information from the thesaurus that could link to Parkendium. So if you see the index term Bob Gurr, then you could link to a page that has all the information about um, you know, the things you contributed to, and then you could link to those and then find out more information about those, and then search Parkendium on those keywords. Um, so it's a work in progress, um, but I still have 32 years uh, before it's kind of crunched on. <laughs> Hey kids, welcome to the Bob Gershow Theater. Come on in. Yeah.